If you're going to be in the music business, you have to understand the business. It, it's as soon as you're going to play. Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations. I am your host, Jason Heath, bringing you today a special episode featuring clips from past guests talking about the business of music. And this caps our jazz week, the first ever all jazz week I've done for the podcast. You can find everything we've put out this week at ContraBaseConversations.com slash jazz. Now, you heard that opening clip from Rufus Reed, and that kind of sets the stage for what we're talking about today, which is the business of music. You're going to be hearing, in addition to that clip from Rufus, you're going to be hearing from John Burr, Miles Mosley, Ben Allison, Ruben Rogers, Ron Carter, Todd Kuhlman, Chuck Israels, and Carlos Henriquez on making a living in the world of jazz today. Links to all of these complete interviews are available in the show notes, and we talk about much more than just music business. And I could have pulled probably another dozen episodes on different topics, but this seemed like a great place to start because it's something that I talked about with the other four guests this week. And before we get started, I'd like to let you know about our wonderful sponsors. I'm so thrilled to have these people on board. I'd like to thank Diderio Strings. And we're doing a giveaway for 10 sets of Kaplan Strings for Contrabass Conversations listeners. You can go to ContrabassConversations.com slash strings to enter that. And they are used by so many artists, many of whom have been on the podcast before, including David Allen Moore, Klaus Freudenstein, Andres Martin, Mark Morton, Mike Valerio, many others. They're designed, engineered, and crafted in the D'Addario String Factory in New York. And thank you for sponsoring the podcast. And thank you to the Bass Violin Shop, which offers the Southeast's largest inventory of laminate, hybrid, and carved double basses. And they offer a great selection of bass bows as well. They have a full line of French and German bows from entry-level student bows through Frechner's and other name makers. Each bow is personally selected prior to sale to ensure that customers can choose from the very best. You can learn more at BassViolinShop.com. And thank you to Rosin Saver, which prevents the evaporation of natural waxes and solvents in your rosin. It saturates the air completely around the rosin and prolongs the life. I've been using it since the end of 2015, and it's like my Pops is brand new. It's been used by members of the New York Philharmonic, the Metropolitan Orchestra, Royal Concertgebouw, and many others. You can go to rosinsaver.com and enter the promo code HEATH. H-E-A-T-H, to get 10% at checkout for any and all orders. We kick off this episode on the business of music with John Burr. And this is an interview from back in the old days of the podcast. I think this was 2009, maybe something like that. John and I talk about what it takes to make it in the jazz business in today's day and age, or really what to do to make it in the music business in general today. And I think it's a great way to kick off the episode. Here's John. The horizon has... Uh, you know, has changed a lot over the years. I mean, when I got to New York yeah. uh, in 1975, you know, there was all, you know, everybody was like sitting around saying, oh man, you know, like, it's like, it's not like it used to be. It's like, oh man, there's no place to play, you know, like there's nothing <laughs> happening, you know, like, it, yeah. you know, are the big bands going to come back, <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. I mean, it, but you know, um, and, you know, there are some thriving scenes around, but you know, basically, um, you know, a life in music now is in the music business. They have this thing called the 360 deal. <laughs> you know, it's like uh-huh. a manager, a record label. If they sign somebody, they want 360 means like they want they want a piece of everything. They want a piece of your merchandise, your CD sales. Um, okay, if a, a life mm-hmm. in music now is it's really a 360 deal, like um, just one avenue of endeavor isn't going to be um, the, whole, the whole picture. The age of the specialist is over. Um, uh-huh. I mean, um, you know, you, you, you know you, you, there might be a traveling band. Somebody might get on a traveling band and stay out for a while. But all that stuff always comes to an end. So then, so then, what, then what else do you do? So my suggestion to the, to the youth coming up is, you know, uh, have a bunch of different things going. Uh, you know, be um, you know, be a teacher, um, mm-hmm. you know, learn music technology, uh, f- 
find out how to create internet presence, learn what you can about marketing, you know, get on mm-hmm. Facebook and Twitter and, you know, you're, uh, and, and blog, you're uh, an excellent example of that. I hope they're emulating your example. Your blog, by the way, is just, you know, a real point of light, you know, it's like a node in the base universe, you know. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Jen. Oh, man, I was like so glad to see it. It's like s- such a rich resource, you know. You know, I'm, I'm, that's what I would tell kids today, you know, if, if you're coming up, you know, try to be like Jason Heath. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> well, my ears are certainly burning from that. So thank you, John. Uh, much appreciated. And I wanted to follow that clip up with this clip from Miles Mosley, who really exemplifies what John's talking about and how he's developed his career with his original projects as a sideman, with his composing for films and for commercial enterprises. And here's a bit from Miles about how he has structured his career for multiple income streams. Was there a moment where you started to kind of realize multiple income streams were what you should be exploring? Yeah, I did. I mean, I'm, I'm really fortunate to have a, a fantastic team around me and my managers, Barbara Seeley has been with me since I was 14 years old. So she's, she's always, you know, in some capacity, either been uh, my manager or guardian angel or, you know, uh, uh, sort of business uh, advisor, and at some point in time, we were talking, and you know, her goal for me has always been to manage and build a career that had safety nets built into it for when I was sixty and seventy years old, and not just what you're doing right now. Um, and at some com- conversation, we were talking about uh, just music and, and the music we loved, and and uh, we were discussing Otis Redding and. You know, Aretha Franklin and Ray Charles. And I was saying, man, it's a trip because you listen to those Otis Redding recordings and those musicians are stellar. And I'm a bass player and I couldn't tell you who was playing bass on those records, let alone who was in his touring band. I have no idea. But I love it. I love it. So, you know, here you go, a, a guy who's contributed to some of the greatest music that's ever been recorded and and been a part of maybe a different guy a part of some of the most fantastic live performances that have ever been given and he just goes off and vanishes into obscurity because it becomes really easy to chase you know three five thousand dollar a week sideman gigs but if you don't become your own boss i think this the the business practice applies to almost any field. If you can put yourself in a position in which you're either indispensable or you're the one doing the hiring and firing, you can ensure that you have longevity. It comes with a lot more risk and a lot more responsibility and not everybody's built for that. But if you are, or if you, or if you feel like you can put a team behind you that can help you support the transitioning through different avenues, you know, you have to think of music separate from business because it is the music business. And while we can become enraptured with the joy of making music and stepping on stage in front of thousands of people and all of the perks of it, there's, there's this big monster over there, which is the business of it. And if you're trying to create sustainability, then you have to be open to a broader picture. Or I would suggest that you're open to a broader picture. It doesn't work for everybody. Some people are just great side men and they can, they can uh, take the money that they make from touring with artists and invest it interestingly or you know put it you make their money work for them in different ways not necessarily diversifying their career but diversifying you know their own financial background so uh, it's an interesting <laughs> kind of a bland subject but it's it's uh, it's an inseparable part of what what it is to be a musician in this day and age yeah one of the major challenges facing any kind of musician these days is the recording industry and how that's changed from being a cornerstone of a musician's income to free promotion in a way. Uh, Ben Allison, one of the past guests, brilliant interview, definitely listen to the complete interview if you haven't. He is, in addition to being a jazz bassist and composer and band leader, he's the president of the board of the New York chapter of the Recording Academy, which is the group that puts on the Grammys. And this is an excerpt from Ben talking about how the recording industry has changed trends that he sees and what he's working with the Recording Academy to do in this regard. 
as an independent artist, I mean, I've been on a label for many years, but as an independent artist really came up against the, the realities of the, the business side in a way that I probably hadn't while I was uh, signed to a label and just, and, and also everything's been so kind of um, in flux and upended by these kind of new uh, distribution methods. Mm -hmm. And so my, my, when I was given the chance to get involved in the recording Academy, it just gave me this uh, kind of a platform to talk about these things and also connected me to the people who are really um, trying to affect change and, and, uh, first of all, figure out what's going on, and secondly, try to come up with some some real solutions. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, YouTube is a, has been a big thorn in the side for a lot of artists, and and not just independent artists, but but really everybody on the creative side, on the, the you know the people who actually create music. I mean, it's it, we live in a in a strange time. I mean, we artists and we record labels. We love our audiences. We love when they check out our music. We want to make this available as possible. We embrace technology. I use it every day. I mean, these are all kind of givens. On the other hand, more people get their music from companies that don't sell music yeah. than ever before. And so that's really the paradigm shift. So there's been this kind of move away from artists creating records, record labels, making them and selling them distribution channels, putting them right into the hands of the, the consumer and the consumer paying for them. That kind of model that is really um, built the music industry as we know it over the last hundred years has really been upended by these kind of new delivery systems. Yeah. Um, so now you have companies that are really, really have no vested interest in music per se, because they're not selling music, they're selling ad space and they're accumulating data. Yeah. And that's where they're being monetized and they're financed by, you know, Morgan Stanley with venture capital, but you know, Morgan Stanley doesn't, isn't interested in selling records. That's not really where they're, you know, right. Yeah, where exactly. Where their interest is, right? Yeah, they're right. Interested in, in, the, in the monetization of it and the value of it. And the valuation of these companies is really based on the data, the user data that they accumulate and they're using music kind of as the lure to get that user data. I know it's, it's kind of a big concept, but it's been happening gradually, but pretty strongly over the last six, seven, eight years. And so a lot of artists have become concerned about that as, as the industry's moved in that direction. You know, it's just an uncertain time and we're kind of figuring it out. I mean, labels are slowly figuring out how to make money in this way, but artists and labels aren't always on the same page, <laughs> right. obviously, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, so it just puts uh, the creative side in, in an awkward position. Oh yeah. To be as always at the bottom of the food chain. And it's just, uh, it's a tricky time. Balancing all of these multiple tasks, the administrative tasks, practicing, booking gigs, making it to gigs, returning phone calls, texts, emails. That's what so much of a percentage of a musician's life is taken up with. And here's a clip I love from Ruben Rogers, who is a super side man for sure plays with, everybody, you name it, and spends so much of his time on the road. Here's what Ruben does when he wakes up at 3 a.m. and he can't get back to sleep. What do you do if you wake up at 3 a.m.? Are you on the computer? Are you writing? Are you corresponding? What kind of work are well, you doing? Actually, it's funny how you say it. You, you say it I, yeah, a lot of corresponding. You, yeah. I feel like I spend more time corresponding than I even play playing the bass these days. I mean, just because I, I have so many moving parts in my musical life, you know, yeah. being a, I guess, a super side man, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it's just that kind of thing, just between texting and, and, uh, and, and, I, and being that I, I deal with a lot of people all around the world these days, it's, it's kind of like just trying to fit the pieces in or whatever, you know, it's, that's probably the, the main thing I try to do. And I, and I also have like a couple properties that I, I actually own, um, you know, I have a vacation rental that I have mm -hmm. that randomly, that's a part of my life too, that I kind of like, <laughs> sure come off a gig and I, you know, I uh, see, oh, oh, thank you for, uh, thank you for your inquiry, Clairview Villas. Uh, yes, we are available, please. You know, you know, that's just my, yeah. my side thing that I, I got, got into.
Now, in terms of preparing people for the future, here's a quote from my interview with Ron Carter about why he focuses on the bow with his students and how it helps with employment and stability. And then I'm going to follow that up with a clip from Todd Kuhlman. And by the way, congratulations, Todd, for being the new jazz bass professor at Indiana University. That's very cool. The clip from Todd is actually about some advice that Ron Carter gave him. You do a lot of work with the bow with your students. Yes. Uh, is that primarily for intonation or just to round them out as a player? Both. To round them out as a yeah. player primarily. They have pretty good pitch. Mm -hmm. I just want to make them be more competitive for the New York market of off-Broadway shows and to be a Broadway sub or have a job in a Broadway pit band. There's good money there. The music is great. The study, you get the benefits. You get the, to the hospital. You get the general costs and all that stuff taken care of by the contract by the Broadway show. So it's a wonderful way to make make, make music and then meet, meet guys and the level of music is really high. And it's a good way to kind of get the bass under control, be guaranteed to play it every night for as long as that particular show runs. So it's more for their rounding out of shows and rounding out of performance and the kind of work that's in New York rather than specifically to have to play better in tune. It was really wonderful one time speaking with uh, Ron Carter and he had a bass with him and and he took his fingers and he made like a bracket with his two index fingers uh, around, say like half first and maybe approaching second position, that area of the fingerboard. And he said, remember, Todd, he said, 90% of the money is made on 10% of the fingerboard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Having a role model, specific bassist, musician, mentor, what have you in mind is so critical when you're developing and creating your own thing. And Chuck Israels, in my interview with him, he put it so eloquently and describes the focus that having a clear, specific role model has on your growth and development. Maybe, maybe just speak a little about that mentor and imitation and that, that whole uh, process. Well, if you were for example, an aspiring sports guy or a gal, let's imagine you were, you wanted to be a basketball player. If I asked you who your favorite basketball player was and you told me, yeah, I know, I like everybody. I listen to, I, I, I watch them all. Yeah. It would be a strange response. Mm -hmm. uh, if at this, I don't know who all the people are now, LeBron James or or before that, Michael Jordan and uh, Magic Johnson. And somebody would be your, you would say, boy, that guy, that guy can really, that guy can really play. And he has these moves and those moves. And oh boy, all I want to do is try to be like that. And that's how you get to be a good basketball player. Well, it's the same thing with, with anything that you do. You need somebody or bodies to show you how it's done. And many of the students that I have, not all of them, but many of them have, have just liked the idea of being a jazz musician, of standing up in front of their friends and being creative and being recognized as being creative. And they are taught by the system that you learn to do that by studying the musical equivalent of the alphabet and grammar. Mm -hmm. And I cannot imagine a poet learning to, someone learning to be, a, learning to write poetry by studying the alphabet and grammar. I believe it is necessary to read and understand and love someone's poetry. Dealing with the business of music can be stressful for sure, overwhelming for sure, but if you're in it for the long haul, it's good to take a long view of this whole process. And I wanted to close out this episode today, which I really hope you enjoyed. I love putting these together. I'm closing this out with a clip from my interview with the great Carlos Henriquez. I posed the question I posed to so many people, what advice would he give his 18-year-old self? And I just love what he says. If you could go, I mean, you've done so much in your career. If you could go back and give your 18-year-old self some advice, what, what, would you, what would you give? Well, if I would go back to me at 18, I would tell myself to, um, hmm, wow. I would tell myself to be patient 
uh-huh. and not to, uh, I would tell myself to be patient and to not worry about what's happening musically and just to, you know, learn music and to enjoy music and to ask as many questions as you can to all the other musicians because I was able to hang out with a lot of the older jazz musicians and um, Latin musicians who passed away, but I didn't get to ask them those right questions, you know? Mm Mm-hmm like how it was before the amplifier, you know, and all these little, you know, tricks of how do you get a bigger bass sound? You know, do you move against the corner, set up against the wall? You know, those stories about bass, you know, Bobby Rodriguez having to record his bass in the corner of a studio so that the bass sound off the wall can, you know, give a little enhancement. You know, just little things like that. And, uh, but the key is to be patient. Mm-hmm. You know, the one thing you, you, you forget is that when you're young, you, you, you rush very hard to be old, you know, and when you start getting to that age where you start becoming somebody who you looked at and you looked up to, then you start saying, wow, look how fast I got up to this level. That's going to do it for this episode about the business of music with some of the major names in the jazz world. I really hope that you enjoyed this. I'd love to hear from you. Do you like these? Do you want more of these? And the way to get in touch is feedback at contrabaseconversations.com. I'm planning on doing these on a semi-regular basis. They do take a fair amount of work to put together, but they're really enjoyable for me. They're like a little research project and getting and thinking about the context of what I was talking about with these different people. I really don't have any idea how these are going to turn out until I actually open up my audio editor and start plugging these clips in. I was not expecting this to be a music business episode. Actually, I thought it might be a crazy jazz gig story episode. And as I dug through my notes and I saw what people talked about. This was a theme that kept coming up again and again. And as I put up these episodes earlier this week, that was a theme that came back over and over. So I hope that you found some value in this. You can check out the complete interviews for all of these people in our show notes, and you can check out the hundreds of other interviews at our website, ContrabasedConversations.com. And if you're new to this podcast, you can subscribe on iTunes, on Google Play, on Stitcher. You can download our free app all sorts of ways to get this content. And all of those options are available at ContraBaseConversations.com slash subscribe. That's going to do it for another episode, and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.